I'm Adrian Von Weitz, the Director of Education at the BAS. And I, uh, on behalf of our Director, Sylvia Covino, I welcome you to this event, an event that is due to the great ingenuity of Juan Carlos Zaldivar and the Miami Filmmakers Collective. What happened was, when we opened the show in, was it May? In each show, uh, Juan Carlos went into me and said, boy, I would really love to have a discussion with Eve about her process. And uh, Juan Carlos is a very distinguished character. He's award-winning. Uh, he, uh, he's done uh, things that have appeared on PBS. Forever he's changed my uh, mind about Jose Martí. And uh, he's a great leader in the community. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Juan Carlos and Eve and our new curator of exhibitions, Jose Diaz. Uh, who will uh, begin a kind of simulating discussion, and then we will be open until 9 o'clock, so if you haven't gone through Eve's work, you will hopefully have some time afterwards to take another look at it. But we've held it over because we love it so much. It'll be here until November. So bring your friends uh, if you're in Preston. Come back and see us. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming. I know there's a lot going on this weekend with uh, downtown art day. So we really appreciate you uh, being here today. Thank you so much for Adrian, who really brought her, um, the collective and the Bass Museum to, to get this wonderful event um, on the way. So um, I wanted to just, before I go on and introduce uh, our speakers, uh, um, just introduce a couple of other members of the collective here, because it's not just me, there's actually five of us, and we're all co-founders and equal part of this. Ron Benetrani is here, I make Bruce Allegri is here, uh, Ali Kalina might be here a little bit later. Um, and then David Fenster, who is presently in LA. Uh, the Miami Filmmakers Collective is really a laboratory of, um, of film and video events that will provide an environment for local filmmakers to talk and engage in national as well as international dialogue. Uh, we um, are made possible in part by a grant from the Knight Foundation as part of the Knight Art Challenge. Um, here, and it has a matching grant from the Miami-Dade Cultural Affairs Office. So with that, I, I have the pleasure of introducing Eve Sussman, whose work is on display um, um, upstairs, and, and Jose Carlos Diaz. So I'm going to read you a, a little bio for each of them to give you a context. Um, Eve Sussman is an artist with diverse practice that includes film, video, sculpture, photography, and installation. In 2003, uh, she began working under the rubric Rufus Corporation, which is a, a think tank including performers, artists, musicians, writers, and programmers who have collaborated on uh, 80 Seconds of Alcazar, which is also on display upstairs, The Rape of the Saving Women, uh, White on White, Algorithmic Noir, and Yuri's Office. Uh, her work has been shown internationally in exhibitions at the Reina Sofia in Madrid, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Whitney Museum of uh, the Whitney Museum in New York, the Louisiana Museum in Denmark, and the National Gallery in London. Uh, this past spring, she led. Um, she led. Uh, yeah. no, she, oh, you had. <laughs> you had a, a, a show at the Leon Museum in Seoul, Korea, and the Bass Museum here in Miami. Um, as well as at the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montreal, in, and that was last night. Just close. Um, she has also received support from the Guggenheim Foundation, Creative Capital, NISCA, Knight Club, um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. That's not Foundation. Together with Simon Lee, Susan uh, Sussman co-founded the Walkabout Oyster Theater, which is a micro-theater space run out of their studio in Brooklyn. Sussman and Lee are also producing for Jack and Lee Ruby, who perform, who are two reform criminals, who are creating film and video installations. And that's actually a work that you are presently engaged in. So um, we're going to get a little sneak peek, and Eve will talk about it uh, towards the end of the talk. Yeah, we can talk about it. Uh, at any time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, so, so please help me welcome. Uh, <laughs> Jose Carlos Diaz is uh, the Bass Museum of Art's new creator of exhibitions. Uh, prior to this, Diaz worked at the Tate Liverpool, where he created Tate Liverpool is 25, 
an anniversary exhibition. And he also organized uh, Charlene von Hale's uh, Now or Elise and Dog Icon, The Source, which was the first public art commission in the UK, right? Um, by American art artist uh, Dog Icon. He has also served as a project coordinator for the reinvention of a series by, uh, of Alan uh, Kaprov happenings during the 1910 Liverpool Biennale. Uh, he has also received a Master of Art in Cultural and Cultural History from the University of Liverpool and a Bachelor of Art in Art History from San Francisco State University. In 2003, uh, he tenured as a curatorial intern, excuse me, intern at the Rubelt Family Collection here in Miami and launched a nomadic curatorial project called uh, Warhol War Land, yeah. which is very helpful to see. So thank you for, for letting me uh, moderate this conversation. Um, so I guess we, uh, we, we were talking and we wanted to maybe start um, um, independently, maybe each one of you want to give a statement about uh, how you view video as a form, either to work or to exhibit. Uh, what are some of the main things that attract you to the form? Um, what are some of the things that scare you about the form? Whatever you want to talk about. Um, but we're also interested in, in this um, middle ground between filmmaking and the visual arts, right? Which I think your work very much uh, straps. So um, with that, any, any, any sort of opening thoughts that you want to talk about either your process or you, how, how do you come to working with them? You want me to start first? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, it's a big question. Um, I guess, let me, let me try to find which angle to go from. Um, I'm really interested in ideas about the cinematic and, and sort of the one thing that uh, Juan Carlos and I were talking about earlier today at lunch was the idea of what is a movie. And so I feel like in a lot of the work that I've done over the last, say, 10 years, there's definitely been a question, raising that question, sort of trying to push the envelope and challenge the idea of what is a movie. Um, for me, partly because I don't work in the film world, I work in the art world. I'm very much an artist who happens to use film as one of my mediums, not the only thing I use, but one of the things I use is motion pictures. And over the last eight to ten years, it's been predominantly film and video, with an interest in trying to sort of use cinematic language in a way that we don't normally see it used in mainstream cinema. But there are definitely um, ideas about sort of subverting cinematic language, but taking advantage of what you can do with that. Um, so, I mean, I'm not coming out of the history of video art that really comes out of a history of performance and a history of turning the camera on yourself, and I'm coming out much more of a history of cinema. But then trying to question what that really means, and the, that main question ends up being, well, what is narrative? And so what you have upstairs is really a piece where the narrative has been completely dissected. Um, and I don't know that if any people in the room have gone upstairs already or have seen the piece already. The piece started as a 86 minute feature, experimental feature film. So you'd see it in a movie theater potentially, at a film festival, or possibly in a gallery, but on one screen, like a feature film, running for 86 minutes with five acts. But it, over those five acts, in a rather abstract way, it did tell the rape, the story of the rape of the Save Black Women, which if you aren't aware of the myth, the piece is really based on the myth. And the myth is the story of the founding of Rome. Romulus founds Rome, opens the gates of the city, says anybody can come in who wants to come in. Well, who comes in? A bunch of ne'er-do-wells and single men and criminals. And so they start building this great city, and but he's only got men. So he realizes the city's gonna die out, they've gotta marry out these men, procreate, have children. They go to the neighboring tribe, the Sabines, ask if they can marry the daughters. They're shooed away as a bunch of criminals. They're like, you know, you're a bunch of Australians. Get out of here. We're not going to let you marry our daughters. So they get chased away, so they have to hatch a plan to steal them. And in the, in the actual myth that's in, uh, in the history of Rome that you can read in Levy and in some of the other ancient documents, the story is maybe three or four lines long. And so they hatch a plan to steal these women. They're successful, they throw their party, they steal the women. And the women acclimate, they become Roman, they have babies, and at some point the Sabine tribe decides they're gonna avenge this crime, maybe years later. And they try to go back, start a war with Rome, and you have the very famous painting by David where you see Hercilia, the wife of Romulus, putting herself in the middle of the two armies and all of the women and the children are behind her trying to separate the two armies from bludgeoning each other to death. 
In reality, what happened is the Sabots got wiped out. <laughs> but in the myth, they all kind of made peace and everybody lived happily ever after. We took that story and subverted it, updated it to the 1960s, but still told the basic story of the abduction of these women. The idea that they acclimated become Roman, which is what you see in that white cube we built, which is the house, which is sort of our metaphor for the heyday of Rome. And then the idea that it all falls apart in the end. In the end, everybody does start fighting each other, which is kind of what happened. Um, and so, but, but we also felt it was important to update it to the 60s, and for me it was also important to do it without language to do it using only gesture and choreography and music and sound design. Um, and then what we got to do here at the best for the first time was <laughs> actually take the five acts, which the first act is sort of the delivering of the history, where you, the men are in the museum and history kind of is fed back to them. And then they convene, we call it the convention, where they're in the airport and they all come together as a group. And then you see these women sort of as a mirage, like sirens in the distance. And then the abduction, which takes place in the meat market, then the idea that the women actually become Roman and have these families and are sort of living the, the supposed high life, and then the final fight scene where everything falls apart. And so we got to split those five acts apart over the architecture of the space upstairs, which was the first time we got to do that. But the piece is still kind of trying to push the boundaries of what it, how you can tell a narrative, that you can actually <laughs> physically take this one screen movie and split it into, we actually have about 30 screens up there with all the TVs mm -hmm. and the little projectors. So I don't know if I so, the no, yeah, you did, and then it kind of just leads to, to to the idea of space, right? And, and the idea of taking something that was originally linear, and then displaying it throughout space. So, from a curatorial standpoint, uh, any uh, I wanted to kind of hear from you in terms of as a curator, how do you approach video, or has that changed over time? And during the work that you've done with the other installations that you mentioned, yeah, it's absolutely changed over time. I really yeah. said video because it's such a such a new medium, uh, at least in the art world. Museums are trying to acquire video, um, in sort of uh, time-based arts, and even uh, because technology was so limited in the 60s and 70s when it was starting, um, it was limiting what you could do with technology and uh, filmmaking. So it started out with uh, recording performance, that sort of thing. Um, I think Nanjing Pike really was the, the father of video installation, that sort of thing. He was experimenting with the technology of it, which I found really fascinating. Um, this was in the 60s. But from a curatorial perspective, a lot of a lot of times where um, I think we've been focused with just showing single channel sort of video was been the easily to access or even to acquire. And what has got me thinking is really the cinematic experience versus the gallery institutional experience, which is quite different. You can go to a movie or the cinematic experience to the screen and sit in front of it, which is, I guess, what the rate of satellite like was. Initially, yeah. yeah. And so what artists are able to do today, like contemporary artists, they're able to rush the narrative uh, physically and um, because of technology shows in new ways that you see um, rate of satellite like women. You start off with projections and then it, it starts, uh, the space itself is physically, um, it's a physical journey. But then uh, Eve's been able to add sculptural elements such as the non <coughs> And uh, I think one thing that's interesting about Eve's work with filmmaking and video art is that <coughs> I think you're uh, very conscious of the aesthetic, everything from the costumes and the aesthetics on the film, but also in terms of what's happening within the exhibition space. And that's a really, a really big challenge, I think, for curators because it's site specific, but I think the piece itself will, is forced to transform. Uh, if it would ever be presented again. So, yeah, and, no, for sure. For and, sure. We would have to fit it to the architecture and redesign the, the five spaces depending on the architecture that we're given. And mm -hmm. so this was very much designed for this architecture. Yeah, and then the sound is really interesting because Adrian was pointing out um, also that the, the cacophony of the other videos when you first come in almost sound like a battle, right? Like mm -hmm. it, 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 it almost sounds like sword fighting <laughs> when, you're, when you're in the first room, which is really interesting. Because it sort of gets revealed. Well, you're like hearing the vibes in the meat market. And, 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 and yeah, maybe the taps. You yeah, know, the taps the, the, in the temple. So, um, so how, how did that, um, how was that for you to conceive something that was was going to be linear and then what was that trajectory like? Well, I mean, it was something that actually uh, I worked with a great editor called Kevin Messner when we edited the Rachel Sam Island. And it was, a, it was a pretty arduous process to edit that piece. And 
And one of the, we had talked about early on, years ago, um, oh, we should take the five, we had always conceived of these in five acts, you know, the, the museum, the airport, the meat market, the house, and then the Herodian theater with the flight tactics. So these distinct five acts, kind of like most traditional theater or opera. And, um, and so we always talked about, well, the five acts would each be in their own room, and you could sort of flow through the piece. And because it's an experimental narrative, it's not really a linear narrative. It doesn't really matter if you spend, you know, 30 seconds or 10 minutes in Act 1 or in Act 3. You can sort of watch them and flow back and forth through them um, as you see fit, and they kind of gel together. Because it's not as if there's like bits of dialogue that you have to catch or you won't get anything. You get the physicality. It's really a physical theater piece, right? People talk about physical theater, this whole genre of, of dance theater and physical theater that is mostly worked out through choreography. And in this, in this case, through choreography and through sound. And, um, and you get the sort of just the emotional gist of what's going on fairly quickly, I think. You know, I think most people do. Um, and so you sort of can flow through those different emotional states with the time that you want to take. It's not, it doesn't demand that you have, you can have a very different kind of attention than you would in a traditional cinematic space. Um, so the idea of putting it in five spaces was something that was always in the back of our mind. But we, we, we just kind of like, that'd be cool, let's, let's put it into five, five rooms. But we never really thought about how to do it. And so then suddenly when that opportunity arose, we realized, oh my god, this is a lot of work. <laughs> this is huge. And, and we sort of realized we could highlight things that weren't, we weren't able to highlight in the, in the feature film. I mean, in the 86-minute in the feature film, uh, the tempo scene is quite different, actually. Because that was shot as an uncut choreography that's about 10 minutes long. But in a feature film, putting a 10-minute choreography uncut, 10 minutes long, it just doesn't work. That's too, that's actually frustrating for an audience. But when you can flow through it in that sort of hallway way, you can spend 10 minutes in front of it, or you can spend one minute in front of it. Mm -hmm. And actually, you'll get, you'll understand the idea of the unison and that the men are walking together, that they have taps on their feet, that they're opening the newspapers at the same time. And, it, and you'll see it when you go in, and you'll see it when you go out. And so the point that you intervene with the choreography doesn't actually matter, but it allows us to have these longer, sort of more, Pensive moments that that a traditional film structure doesn't allow you to see, and that's very freeing. That's actually quite exciting. Do you prefer, do you, which one do you prefer? I don't know if I prefer, but it, it's just there's certain rules about. I mean, you know, better than anyone. There's certain rules about how you construct a standard feature, and we weren't trying to make a standard feature film, but you can't bore people to death. Whereas when you have these kind of long-running ambient pieces. It's not that you're allowed to bore people to death. People are allowed to stay interested for as long as they want. And I don't care if they spend 30 seconds or they spend 30 minutes. It doesn't matter to me. It, uh, what I care about is that they can sort of conflate these things in their brain and somehow come out with a narrative. But what I'm really interested in is suggesting narrative. How do you, what can we give you that allows you to make a story so that you get involved? It's not, I mean, to me, the, the main thing that's really important I mean, when Jose talks about you know, single screen video. Well, single screen video is a lot like television a lot of the time. And as good as television is getting now, a lot of television is really problematic. I mean, there's great stuff on TV now. I never really watched TV, but I know there's great writing going on, and great series and whatever. And like The Wire was the best show ever made, and all this. I mean, that's all great. And I'm super excited for all those people that are doing that work. It's great, really smart work. But television has a very specific thing it's trying to do. And if you want to break out of that box and go in any other more experimental direction, then one of the things that really helps you do that is having a lot of screens, or having a different space, or having a space that you don't just plop yourself in front of and veg out. But the other thing that, that television does is it kind of spoon speeds you everything. It actually doesn't, you don't take part in the same way. You're given the story. You know, it's it's not implied. You are told the story, and lately that's been being done really well with great writers. But a lot of the stuff like that I grew up on, it wasn't, you know, it was pretty lame. 
And a lot of it's pretty, you know, a lot like they like, just create this or that sort of fair and middling stuff where writing is actually bad. And so, like, what happens if you sort of like, imply stuff, but actually don't depend so much on language? And so, you know, the part of the thing about making a piece that's a period piece, okay, we took an ancient story, we weren't going to do it in an ancient period because most of the time that was ridiculous. Right? I mean, I don't care if you're making Troy or Gladiator and you have $300 million. It's always a little bit of a parody of itself, and people are speaking like fake Elizabethan English. Like, what the hell is going on? That's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, that you can't imagine how, in those times, how people spoke or what, what language they used. Or you, don't, you don't have any of that. So it makes sense to take an ancient story and at least put it photographically in a period that we can remember, you know? Yeah, in a way it makes it more universal to abstract it, right, because people come to it from the room. So and to imply it. I mean, the, the one thing that people ask more, not so much with Great Say About Women, but more with White on White, which is a, a, a piece where, um, where a computer generates the narrative, is, well, is it interactive? And the answer so is yes. Let me give a little clarify yeah. for people who don't okay. know. Uh, if you want to describe one of them. This is another project, uh, which is not here, but it, it relates to what we're talking about. Well, it relates to the idea of experimental narrative and implied narrative. And I think there's very much going on here, both in 89 seconds with implying narrative and the great say by women with implying narrative and not spoon feeding the narrative. That people have brains and you don't have to underestimate the intelligence of your audience. And that people like actually being able to take part. And so, um, so White on White was. White on White is a film that generates live, generates the narrative live as you as you watch it. We wrote an algorithm, there's about 3,000 video clips, about 30 hours of footage, 150 pieces of music, and 80 voiceovers. And there's an algorithm that uses uh, keywords and tags to recreate the narrative differently every time the movie plays. And so you never quite know what you're going to see, and you never quite know how the narrative is going to lay out, and you never know how the movie's going to be edited, because the computer's editing live. And it, there is a text in this movie, there is other voiceovers, and there's a dialogue. And, but you, you, you walk away with a slightly different idea of what the story is every time. And a lot of what you do is actually put the narrative together in your head. A lot of things are implied. They're not straightforwardly said. And so people also say to me, well, is it interactive? Can I get in there and like run the computer? And I want to see only shots of birds. Can I make a show only, only shots of birds? And I'm like, well, it is interactive, but no, you can't run the computer. It's interactive in that you're actually writing the story as you watch it. And that's something I think mainstream film and television doesn't do. You don't write the story. Somebody else is doing it. And also the idea of losing control, of being, uh, of being in, a, in an environment that's all about the experience as opposed to the linear uh, progression of the experience. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, I love mainstream filmmaking, and I'm a huge fan of certain directors, but uh, the idea that we can imply things and that the, the story is kind of made by you is, is actually what happens when you walk down the street every day, you know? I mean... Which leads up to the, your interest in both photography and surveillance, right? And to some extent? Mm -hmm. So maybe... Um, can I talk about, about that? that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, when, when one of the things people really say, about, obviously, about these two pieces is, well, they're inspired by painting. And certainly there's, there's really strong references to painting in these pieces, but to me they're equally, if not more so, inspired by the idea of surveillance and what it means to sort of be a fly on the wall and just watch things happen. And as a filmmaker, one of the things I'm most excited about is just assembling some people in a room, maybe actors, maybe not actors, and just watching what happens. And just watching. And like you're, you are the surveillance camera. And so, you know, with, with 89 Seconds, which is the first piece that you see when you walk in the gallery up there that is based on Las Meninas by Velasquez, it was really about what if you were a fly on the wall in that room? What if you were the surveillance camera, you know, circumnavigating that room? What would you be seeing? And what would you be, and then what would you be inventing about what you saw? Because if you are the fly on the wall, like just when you, walk, like if you walk into a cocktail party, you're immediately like trying to sum up what's going on in that room. Who's talking to who? Who's in a relationship with who? Who's flirting with who? Who's having a fight with who? You're immediately gauging the energy of the room and trying to understand what's going on and what you surmise might be right or might be completely fictional. 
And we do that every day. And so part of my interest in surveillance is how what, you, what those cameras see, whether you're you know, photographing in the street or you're catching things on a camera that's in a supermarket, you're sort of surmising what you think is going on. And I've always been very interested in what happens when you start adding little bits of text into that, little bits of narrative. I like the fact that if you look at the regular side, I wonder that there's the, the small projectors that have the behind the scenes, it's your own surveillance, your, your crew. But it's also interesting that as a museum, we have we have surveillance as well. Right. Uh, we're monitoring our visitors, because obviously the things here are very valuable. Right. But this idea you can't really escape surveillance. No, totally. And now with all the things, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like it's everywhere, right? It just inundates our lives. And as horrifying as, as that is, there's part of me that sort of thinks, well, we're kind of on film all the time anyway. So let's at least make it interesting. You know, let's, let's add some text to it. Like, what if you just had? A running text there, mm -hmm. on this as you were like on the subway platform, you know. Um, so I'm, I, I am very interested in just sort of what appears in front of all these cameras and how we can sort of subvert that, or how we can work with that, or what happens when you put yourself in the position of one of those cameras. Um, and so there's yeah, there's there's definitely I've always been interested in what these surveillance cameras can do. Um, it's also, in, the, the fragmentation of the narrative is also interesting because more and more, this is how we're experiencing media, right? We're watching movies on this, we stop and start and we fast forward them to the good part, or we watch them, you know, a little bit in bed, a little bit in the bathroom, a little bit, of, you know, in, in the subway on the way home or whatever. Um, and so I think that this also speaks, um, I wanted to maybe hear about when you have the film out of the world, when you went through film festivals and things like that, um, did you find, um, that there was a space out there to talk or to exhibit this work that was welcoming? Or, or did you find that you always had to kind of carve your, your way into this? I mean, the regular government has been invited a lot to different exhibitions and occasionally occasional film festival. Um, my feeling is, I mean, one of the things I think I realized is it does, you know, it, it, it plays as a sort of cinematic piece at film festivals, and then we've installed it plenty of times as a single screen kind of big room installation in museum spaces or galleries. But I started feeling like, at least in the museum space, as a single screen, 86 minute film in a museum where people wander in and out, it just doesn't make sense for, an, for a really abstract, or even for a less abstract film. People don't come to museums with that kind of concentration, that kind of energy. They come with the idea of sort of wandering through. And so, I, the piece has been, had been, you know, it been invited to a lot of group shows, and as I said, it's toured around quite a bit. But I've never felt totally comfortable with how it felt in a movie theater or how it felt in a museum space. So what we got to do here was, I think, a step up. It took it to another dimension. Um, I mean, I don't feel so much like I had to carve out a place because I think there are plenty of video artists and film artists working in the art world with cinematic work. I mean, Doug Aiken being a great example, um, Shereen the Shot, Matthew Barney. I mean, there's, just, there's a lot of people who have carved that road before me, after me, you know, at the same time as me. I mean, there's, so there's, there's huge, there's, there's stuff, plenty, plenty of artists working on a cinematic scale with big single screen pieces. Um, you know. Yeah, there's there are a few, but there's still the minority. I think of people who can straddle both of those worlds, right? Because, right. I mean, I, I guess mean, maybe you can name them all. Maybe I name half of them all. Right. You yeah. know, like Shereen, Matthew. I mean, there's there's there's, there's definitely. Um, there there are some. I mean, we were talking about this that um, a film is is popular the more that people see it, right? So the more hits that you have, uh, the more eyeballs that you have, the more popular it is. But with an art piece, uh, it's actually the more rare. Or, or the, you know, because there's this it's objectification. Both. It's both. I mean, certainly, quite, I mean, in terms of the economics of it, to have a, the economics of it in the mainstream film world, yeah, you need 100,000 people to like your movie. I mean, and in the art world, you need 10 people to like your movie. I think with film, it's interesting, though, because uh, film is able to capture new audiences, uh, whether it's a non museum crowd. Um, I was telling you earlier, people who might not necessarily have an art background, they can walk through these uh, installation and experience emotions that don't come loaded with an art history background. Um, they can just react to what they're experiencing. And 
I guess the new challenge for, I guess, contemporary video and film installation is the experience, because when you walk through Eats, um, there's a reoccurring, there's reoccurring symbols like the wolf that appears again, mm -hmm. um, and that the watchman is not the Oh yeah, the old man, yeah. There's an old man that yeah. reappears. He, he, he appears as a, as a guard, he appears as a tourist, he appears so as a... So the experience is always different for the, for the visitor, whether it's someone like myself who's working here, but the experience is, is not even the same when you walk back. Right, which is what's cool about that space. I mean, Sylvia said to me in the beginning, oh, you know, the space is a little difficult because it's a dead end. All the artists complain that you can't make a circle, it's a dead end. But we kind of got the dead end to work for us in that we put the cube at the end and then the graveyard of TVs where the fight scene takes place. So you kind of circle around the house, or maybe you go through the house, and then you're through the little graveyard of TVs, and then you wind back through and you get reminded of the meat market and the airport and the entrance to the museum itself. And there was something, there is something quite funny about entering the piece because the first act takes place in a museum in a museum. So you have like the surveillance of the surveillance of the museum of the museum. And there's some funny little double entendres there or something. Mm -hmm. it, it also leads into the next part, the, 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 the one that you're working on now. So the, both, all, some of the things that we talked about. So the idea of what is a movie, right? Mm -hmm. And what is real and what isn't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is the truth in the process? Mm -hmm. Is it the content? Is it the construct of the filmmaker? You know, what is it? And so, talk a little bit about what this new project is. Um, right. That also has that experience. Talking about Japanese project. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, Simon, my partner, and I have I've been collaborating with and producing for this brother sister team who are um, a bit older than us. Uh, they're in their 60s and they're starting an art career. A sort of a second lease on life after a very different background. They um, they mainly had a career where they, they were American, moved to Australia when they were younger, and did a lot of things, you know, photographed weddings, installed CCTV security systems for rich people, but then they got into the business of creating evidence for people who needed to make insurance claims. And so people needed to you know, they had a painting that they didn't want to sell, but they needed some liquid cash, and they needed the painting to disappear for a while. Mm -hmm. so they could make insurance claims, so somebody would have to create the event, that, like the robbery, or the photography, or the surveillance <laughs> video, of this evidence so that people could make these claims and call the police, or maybe it was just, you know, a bodega got robbed, and they'd have to ransack the place and make it look like a robbery happened. You know, so they were staging these crimes, or, or creating false evidence, um, and they did it for very successfully for about 20 years. In the late 90s, they got caught. They robbed their own house. And they made a first title on their own house got caught. People knew it. It's not so crazy. I, 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 it wasn't the first time I've heard of this. Um, but um, Jack and me, Ruby, we got to know them through their lawyer. And we started communicating with them when they were in these sort of, they were in this low security incarceration facility or jail in, um, in Australia. And we started to you know, look at a little bit of some of this evidence that they had created, some of it going back to the 70s. And they didn't have a lot of it left, but some of it was pretty compelling stuff. And what you realize is pretty close to art. It's kind of like art, you know. <laughs> and they weren't dumb about the art world either, because some of the people they had created some of this fake insurance claim <coughs> evidence for were in the art world. They were collectors or whatever. And so, they also realized that they had the skills to kind of make art, that they could retool their photography skills and some of their surveillance video skills and some of their ideas about how to stage things. They, they knew a lot about stagecraft and building. And Jack, the, the older brother, I think had been a gaffer earlier on in his, in his life. Um, and so they realized they sort of had the skills to make art. They just never called anything they did art. And so we thought, well, all right, we're going to help you guys produce. So based on this, one of the very early scams they did in the 70s, we, Simon and I, pr produced their first artwork with them. And it was shot about a year ago. Uh, it's been shown as a work in progress. It's called Car Wash Incident. There's a, there's a clip online if people are interested. Uh, if you Google Vimeo and Lee, L-E-I-G-H, Ruby, you will find it, and you can watch the trailer. Um, or just, you don't probably just Google her name, the sister, Lee Ruby. Um, you'll find the Vimeo clip. And, um, and it's, it's a pretty compelling thing that they made with our help. Um, and it basically takes this photograph, recreates it, but 
everything in the photograph has been doubled. So what you see in the photograph is a car wash sign, a woman crossing uh, a lot with a plastic bag, a station wagon, a woman getting out of the station wagon, and a man in a suit crossing the street, and there's a driver in the car. So there were four characters. There was a 1973 station wagon, there's a car wash sign, there's a street corner. So what we did for Jack and Lee is we, we sourced or we built all of that. We sourced two 1973 Vista Cruiser station wagons, which we still own. Um, and then we built everything in that photograph twice. And then there was a choreography arranged that they directed together with the choreographer that um, I've worked with before. And then there was a whole dialogue that happened. And so this brought in interest that Simon and I both had about surveillance, um, ideas about narrative, experimental narrative, fractured narrative. Also, yeah, the, the double up because that, the, the second piece with the two men, with the man in the station, you know, has this idea also of two of history sort of repeating You're itself. You're talking about upstairs, in oh, the in, the, in the airport. Yes. In, the, in, the, in the, the old, where you see the old man looking down, yeah, so and you have the two screens of mm -hmm. the men all doing unison. Yeah, right? so there's this idea of history repeating, history repeating itself, itself, and not being quite exactly the same, but right. sort of the same. And what, yeah, I, what I love about the Temple Hop piece that's upstairs is that it's actually a choreography, where everybody's trying to do everything. We've got 40, 40 men are in the airport trying to do everything in unison. So they're trying to cross their legs together, and they're trying to open the newspapers together, they're trying to smoke at the same time, they're trying to walk in unison. And inevitably they fail. And so when, the, when that little two-screen thing starts, you think for a minute that you're seeing the same thing on both screens. And then you realize it falls apart. Right. But you keep waiting for that to happen. Right? Yeah. So yeah, and so there's a point about the desire to try to do it right, whatever right means, and then the inevitable failure, that they are going to fail. They're not going to be able to do this the same way twice, and they're probably not even going to be able to do everything at the same time, because unison is really difficult. And so the, the, uh, the sort of the success and the failure of that is something that I really love about it. Um, and, in, and so in this new piece, uh, and the piece that's on Vimeo has two, it's a two-channel, but the video has kind of a split screen, right? <laughs> uh, so on one side we're seeing one depiction of the event, and then the other is a recreation. You're seeing different takes. You're actually seeing sometimes different the characters are doubled, right? All the characters are doubled. Yeah. They're, they're, they're doubled all the time, <laughs> but what, the way that the actual installation works is at first you see things very close up and very tight, and slowly, slowly, slowly the camera pans out, and by if you watch, depending on when you walk into the room, at some point it's revealed that the entire set and all of the characters are there twice. And so, and that there's these two groups of four or four characters, so there's eight characters, and they're actually telling contradictory stories. So it's sort of like, what's going on? Is it a pass off of like a, a drug thing? What's in this plastic bag? Some people are getting it, some people are giving it away, some people are trying to get rid of it, some people are afraid, some people are excited. So you have all these opposite conversations and opposite emotions and these double There are eight tracks of audio too. There's right? eight tracks of audio, there's two screens, and there's always sort of this contradictory story. I was going to ask actually, talking about the double screen with that, um, what is your selection of presentations I noticed in this particular exhibition? Um, we talk about the history of technology, there's so many, you know, there's, there's cameras, there's projectors, there's um, the surveillance boxes in the house, I don't know what those are. Oh, yeah, they're um, they're there's they're the they're old they're fashioned they're TVs in the back, which for me, they're very sculptural, and, yeah. um, but they're, also, they're outdated, so what is your selection process on how we want to present? Well, I'm a sucker for that old, for those old, that old technology. I mean, I love the old surveillance monitors and the way things look on them, and, and the idea that you're making a piece of theater, and some, and you're presenting a piece of theater as cinema or as theater, and then somewhere else somebody's actually watching you do it. And so, I, I, I'm, I'm, well, that was what was exciting about this, is we got to mix it all up. We got to use the little pocket projectors that are pretty new technology, and then we got to use old 1970s surveillance monitors that are inside that cube, that white cube. Um, so it's not that I feel like, oh, I have a preference, like, I want to use the newest, greatest thing, you know, and people are all like, it's going to be the best HD and 5,000 lumens and whatever. Um, it, to me, it's all about, you know, suiting the architecture, suiting the piece, suiting what you're trying to, the feeling of what you're trying to do. I mean, in the house, yeah, we needed four projectors because we're projecting onto those four screens. But we also needed those old little surveillance monitors because we needed to have the idea that as these people are living this life, somebody's also watching them. And, and and so that 
to give that emotion and that feeling, you needed a certain type of technology, which I don't think would have been the 1980s big box tubes and it wouldn't have been projectors. It was those little surveillance monitors that everybody knows is what a, like somebody at a guardhouse would be looking at you through, or somebody in a supermarket up in upstairs watching their employees or something, you know. And the idea that there's some somebody more those little boxes give you the message that somebody more powerful than you is in the room with you, mm -hmm. and that was an important idea to communicate. And that's what that type of technology communicates. So every type of technology communicates something else, right? You know, you use a projector and it's a cinematic. You use a little TV and it's a TV. You use a surveillance monitor and you understand it's about a third party that you can't even see. So we're going to open it up for questions in a couple minutes. Yeah, but, um, we're yeah um, in like two minutes. But um, one last thing that came to mind is that uh, this new piece, the Jack and the uh, Ruby piece, mm -hmm. you're, you're, and we talked a little bit about this objectification of, of film, right? And the film by nature is sort of an illusion, and the reality that it represents is arguably an, an illusion. And so there's always this experiential dichotomy that's happening in the way that you experience film, whether you experience it in a black box linearly or whether you walk through a gallery space after a curator you know, that you have. Um, and I found it really interesting that the new piece, you're, you're actually taking all of the content and, and then putting it in this television, right? You want to talk a little bit about that? Um, oh, you mean the, oh, the monitors idea? Yeah. Okay, well... Because that relates also a little bit to your photography. You know, yeah, also. it relates to, well, it relates to the idea of, yeah, I mean, I'm quite interested in how, in the sort of idea of what it means to make a period piece. You know, and that plays again with the idea of the cinematic, right? Like you see, like these big budget movies and they're done in period and everything looks so correct. Um, but those, it goes back also to Jose's question about like, well, what's the device you choose? And Jack and Lee's piece, you know, was based on a 1970s photograph. They directed it and costumed it and did the cars and the heritage and everything to be very much like mid 70s period. And so we had the idea together with them that, you know, we're also, they're also trying to make art in the art world and part of what you need to do is make it economically viable. So there was this idea that each take of the film, each camera original piece of film, which if there were 16 takes, there were 16 reels, they're each about six minutes long, is a mod print. It could be given away or sold. It could be offered out to the world individually. So somebody could have take one, somebody else could have take two, somebody could have take three, and all 16 takes could be for sale. But then how do you make it, well, enough people don't have a 35 millimeter movie projector at home, so how do you make it so they can watch it? So then we transfer, we digitize those takes and put them on DVDs and put them on 1970s television. And so right now, what Jack and Lee have is five of those takes that are in a show in the little gallery of Brooklyn. But eventually, all 16 takes will be on sort of a dated TV that kind of fits the period in which the piece was shot. So it's again about picking the right device, right? I don't think those takes would look so good on 1990s TV. I think they, because of the way it was shot, when you put it on 1970s TV, it's totally nostalgic. You think you're watching a sitcom or a 1970s TV show and then you realize what's going on is crazy. And it's not a 1970s TV show, but there's something great about how it pretends to be a 1970s TV show for about 30 seconds. Yeah. It's also wonderful because when you make a film, all of the footage is part of your experience and your process. But when people see the final film, they only see the selected takes. Well, that's... And, and so the idea of democratizing that or sort of putting that out. It's not even about democratizing. It's again about changing the game and pushing the limits of what is a movie. And this, there's a famous Chinese video artist named Yang Fudong who says a very similar thing. Like that, um, the show I was in in Korea, Yang Fudong was also in that show, and I've shown with him in Moscow as well. And what he says is every piece of film is valuable. And in this day and age, where shooting film, real film, is actually very special now. It's very, it's a special thing to do. Most people shoot video. So if you're shooting real film, it's kind of meaningful and it's precious. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the idea that everything is, every bit of it is valuable is, I think, it's pretty deep. It's something to really consider. Because, you know, when you, in this sort of standard feature film idea, you might shoot 100 hours of film, right? You show, throw away 98 hours. 98 hours is on the cutting room floor. And the way I think about it, the way Fudong thinks about it, 
Nothing's on the cutting room floor. <laughs> First of all, you're not shooting 98 hours. But there's no reason for it to be on the cutting room floor. It's actually beautiful and valuable, and it can have a life. And so the idea, Jack and Lee's idea, and our idea together with them as their producers is each of these 16 takes is something. And, and I'm not just saying that because I think, well, we can put all 16 takes on there. I think that they really, each of these 16 takes really is something and is worth it. And the idea that you're going to pick the best take, like that's a very sort of standard Hollywood movie idea. Well, maybe there is no best take. There's just 16 takes. And, um, and, and so, and so um, Rob Chambers in the back of the room, we weren't in the country, he lied. Um, um, he just shot me, I'm sorry. Um, no, there, you know, that, that, you can, that the idea that you can actually put this stuff like a little bit like in the etiquette of printmaking. And I, I told this to one person earlier today. I, I started as, when I was in high school and a bit of what I did in college was printmaking. And the etiquette of printmaking is when you make an individual print, it's not like any other print, it's called a monoprint. But it's still valuable, it's still an artwork. And so that's how I think about real film now. Real film now are these monoprints. And those monoprints can go out into the world and they can be, belong to people, you know. And so the idea with these individual televisions and these individual takes is that they, they can agree, uh, exist uh, kind of like a monoprint can. So we had, that was my little reminder to open it up. So if it's okay with you guys, we can open it up for questions for either of you. Yes, it is good. Questions back here. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I was thinking that nowadays with technology, there's also the opportunity to create pretty uh, film and use it as part of your work. Um, and so I wanted to ask you in particular why the preference for 2D language instead. And um, 2D, I see that I, I, I see the video installed and, and using the, the architecture of part of it, but um, I see also like a photograph in movement. So um, I wanted to ask you if you have considered. But working in 3D? Yeah. Um, the question really is, have I worked, what I consider working in 3D film? Instead of 2D. I mean, it's interesting because I don't, most of the 3D films I've seen, like whether it's, you know, uh, Vin Vendors made Peanut and there was Avatar and some of these other 3D films, I'm not a big fan of them. But the irony is that out of the blue, I got asked to do a little benefit piece for one of the foundations that's helped me out. And I actually did, again, this idea of the camera original. I shot 120 3D photographs that were camera originals. And then, this gets very techy, I have them cross processed so they were black and white slides that you see with the viewer and then you see these 3D images. But they were still they were photographs. I tried doing it with Super 8 and I've actually never tried projecting it. I'm sort of interested in it as an experiment, but I'm not that interested in it as, I'm not that interested in making a 3D movie, but I have been experimenting lately with lenticular prints. I've been, in, I've been experimenting with 3D stills, but not 3D motion picture. Um, you know, 3D motion picture to do it well is pretty tech heavy. I mean, um, I mean it's possible. You know, people do it low tech, and like I say, I've tried shooting Super 8 low tech. But I think you, I think the problem is you get so mired in the technology of it. Um, you lose a little bit of the experience. I feel like you, you get mired in the tech in the tech issues of it, and I don't know if getting mired in the tech issues is that interesting. Um, but it was it is kind of ironic because I sort of said I don't care at all about three D, and then I ended up making this edition of these three D artworks. Um, and I have been <coughs> making these lenticular prints that aren't three D, but they're like little they're animations kind of, but they look kind of three D. Um, but one of the other things I did with the 3D slides that you see through a little viewer is I blew them up really big, as big, big prints, but then they're just diptychs. They're not 3D anymore. But then they have a little bit the feeling of the temple off piece upstairs because you see the left eye and the right eye next to each other, and the left eye and right eye look almost the same, but they're not the same. And there's something quite eerie about that. So there's interesting things in 3D, I think, but sometimes when you deconstruct it, but I don't know about making a movie that, making an entire movie that uses it. I mean, is it something, is it something you're interested in doing? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Mysterious. Yeah. Another question? So 
So the 16 takes that you were talking about, are they in the market as, as unique pieces? Yeah, the idea is that each camera original is a unique piece. But they're, they're now in a form? They're, well, they, you would, the idea is that there, there's a set, right? So if, a, if an art collector wanted to own take one, they'd get the, the camera original film, the TV, and the DVD. Oh, okay. as, a, as, a, as a unit, yeah. Good option. Well, you could have an option. It hasn't really been worked out yet, but we can, we can talk about it. <laughs> so there are two. So the person in the back has the first, and then the lady with the glasses. Okay. Uh, mine is, my question is a little bit similar to hers, but well, the most interesting thing to me about this piece that Sabine um, is that the immersion in it is so different from the stationary experience of you know watching film on a flat screen, right? You know, and just like the, the the feeling you get, for example, in the meat market, you almost have a feeling of wanting to intervene, <laughs> but you can't because it's, you're, it's a you movie. know it's still a movie. You're, it's still a movie. Yeah. But uh, have you ever thought about um, creating something from the ground up that plays with that unique perspective? It's like almost an omniscient perspective. You can move back and forth through time and through the narrative. Like, have you ever thought about creating something from the ground up that uses that? By the ground up, you mean shooting in a situation? Like, well, creating a, a piece, like this is, you you shot it to be an 86 minute film originally, but you've now arranged it in, in this way. Have but you, you, mean, so you mean setting out, to, setting out knowing that it would be in five rooms right from the get-go? Well, yeah, five or six or four or three or whatever, you know? Um, I guess, you know what's funny is, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a very good planner, and so a lot of the times I just kind of create situations and then we shoot them, mm. and I have no idea how they're actually going to be seen. I guess we're lucky that this is so and, and, um, and And so, you know, did we talk about how the said in a minute it could be in five rooms while we were shooting it? We might have. I don't really remember if we ever talked about would it be on one screen or would it be on 30 screens or in five rooms. At some point during the creation of the piece, we talked about it long before we ever did it here, years before. Um, but the opportunity never arose, and the issue about what we what we were able to do here is most places. And Jose was kind of saying this, you know, curators are much more likely to put a piece in a show or in a film festival if it's on one or maybe two screens, but not on six or thirty, you know. And so. If we had from the ground up said, oh yeah, it's in five rooms on 30 screens, my guess is we probably wouldn't have shown it until this moment. And maybe never, because the only reason it got invited for this moment was because Sylvia had seen it somewhere else as a single screen scene. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the problem is with the from the ground up idea of five rooms is that you, you do make your opportunities quite a bit less because you're going to be much more demanding of the venue, right? And so there was an idea that, okay, well, you got to. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we ever limited ourselves and edited ourselves and said, oh no, we can't do it in five rooms. But um, at the time, I think I was a little bit maybe overly enamored with the idea of pushing the envelope to what a movie looks like and what a movie could do. And could you make a movie that was driven by choreography and music and sound and didn't use language and still have the parameters of a movie, which is to show it on a big screen on one screen. And now, I'm, now I think that's, now I don't care. But then I was, yeah, you know, when you make video art, and maybe you can also attest to this, there is always this holy grail of the feature film. That's always held up as like the highest form, the feature film. Even when you're not a video artist, even if you're a painter, there's this idea that this feature film is this high, high form, it's this high bar that you have to try to get over. And now I think that's kind of a lot of bullet. But at one point, I think I was quite seduced by that idea. And, and it's a, I think it's, now I think it's almost a dangerous idea, it's a stupid idea. But it did mean that we put the piece out there as a single screen movie, and it did get seen a lot. And so then other opportunities come from that, you know. And so, but yeah, we start from the beginning knowing that you want to put it in five rooms. Yeah, that would be that would be cool. I mean, I, but like I say, I'm not such a planner. I don't often. I just don't know. I'll just shoot. I don't know. And then uh, there's another. Yeah. <clears throat> Why did you choose that painting? Did you choose the painting to fit your project, or you develop your project because you like the paintings? Well, I didn't really choose the painting. I felt more like I chose the myth. 
and I felt like a myth. At first, you know, uh, I made a nice exit all the the first single screen piece that you see there. And then I had to put this kind of company together. I, I had been working a lot with for like uh, dancers and for some theater companies and stuff. And they all had companies. And I thought, that's cool. Let's have a company. How come nobody in the art world has a company? You know, dancers get to have companies and experimental theater people have companies. And why can't we have a company? And it was a little bit like a careful you went for, right? Because then you have all these people that want stuff from you and you gotta figure out how you're gonna get everybody what they need and what they want. Um, but there, there is sort of this like ad hoc company. And once we had created that with eight nine seconds, I realized there were these people that had all these skills. Like there was a choreographer that I worked with, and there was a, a DP that I knew now, and there were there were these people that I could um, you know fit, pull back together again. And one of the one of the people I was most close with is the choreographer. I'm actually going to Berlin to work with her in in November on a dance piece. Is um, is well, wouldn't it be cool to do a fight choreography? Like, what choreographer wouldn't want to do a fight choreography? And what, you know, and what, like, who wouldn't want to film that? And so that's where I thought, oh yeah, right, the seven women, it's a big fight scene. And and so I, we sort of chose it. I my, part of the reason we chose it was the myth was interesting, and the myth I felt like was very ripe to be updated to the '60s period, right? When you have those very clear gender roles. And there were ideas about how men were and how women were, and you had that perfect, you know, mid-century modernism that was such a stand-in for the ideas that were living through design, and that you could have this kind of perfect ordained designed life. And that was the idea, I think that was the beginning of really being sold a lifestyle. And I felt like the myths fit all that stuff. And so I don't feel so much like I chose a painting or the painting. I mean, there are a bunch of different paintings around the myth of the Say the women, there's a Bruce Rubens, there's a Poussin, there's a David. Their sculptures as well. But it was less about picking a piece of antiquity and it was more about taking that story, which as I said is about four or five lines long, and fitting it into the period and then trying to expand the idea of what is a movie. It, it's 8.30 and the museum's open until next. I want to give people a chance to go back up. But either here for a while so we 